All right, Craig, take us out. It's great, great to be with you all again. And this week, we're picking up where we left off last week. Um, <clears throat> and, I, and I wish that each week where we left off, we would leave off like at a, um, a normal leaving off place, but we're trying to do it by, by time and it doesn't quite break evenly. So um, <clears throat> we'll finish chapter four and hopefully we'll get into chapter five. I'm actually skipping a little bit, but last week where we left off, we, we were talking about, uh, especially the parable of the sower, the parable that explains all parables in Mark 4 and kind of explains the shape of Mark's gospel, the hiddenness, but the hiddenness that's meant to be revealed. It, it goes on to say there's nothing hidden except in order that it will be revealed. And so the, the ultimate purpose even of the, of the hiddenness is so that someday the revelation will be complete. Well, <clears throat> we come now to the kingdom, again, compared to a seed as throughout Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> in Mark chapter 4 and verse 30. Now, Jewish parables sometimes open with, with what shall we compare such and such a thing? And Jesus is a good Jewish teacher using pedagogical techniques, teaching techniques that were familiar to his audience. And uh, he's going to compare the kingdom in this parable to seed. And not just any seed, but a very small seed. And the point of this parable is that the kingdom has this tiny, obscure beginning, like Jesus' first coming seemed to some people. I mean, they were expecting a Messiah who would overthrow the Romans and establish a kingdom visibly. But the Gospel of Mark goes, well, Jesus in the Gospel of Mark goes from Nazareth to the cross. So sometimes we are into what's big, you know, what, what everybody looks at and says, this is, this has got to be it. But that's not how, that's not how Jesus came. And that's not how God always works. He heals a lot of people uh, in the Gospel of Mark, but the authorities don't get it because they're big and Jesus is not big. They're afraid he's going to get big. He's too popular, but they want to, they want to keep him down. But the final destiny of this small seed is the, is the glorious promised kingdom. So don't despise what looks small to begin with. Now the mustard seed was considered the smallest. Orchid seeds actually technically are smaller, but they're not as common in Judea and Galilee. And, and also it made sense to use the mustard seed because it was proverbial for smallness. That was a common Jewish figure of speech, something as small as a mustard seed. To get an idea how small it is, it's about 20,000 mustard seeds per ounce. So uh, it's pretty small. And yet it grows into a large garden herb. Now, Matthew hyperbolically calls it a, a tree, but, uh, but it's, it's like a tree. It can get really big. Usually it's around two to six feet high, but it can get bigger than that, as we'll see. So here's a picture with uh, some examples of mustard seed, you can see they're really, really small. Uh, you have to have the hand really blown up in size to be able to see. Uh, now, this is not the kind of mustard we have in the Old Testament. For example, when in the morning, Joshua rose early and mustered the people. No, this is uh, the kind of mustard that, well, it's related to the kind of mustard you know you, you put on your hot dog or whatever if you eat hot dogs but probably not the same kind of mustard, not yellow mustard. It was probably black mustard. It's related, but uh, black mustard is, is hotter than the kind of mustard many of us are familiar with. And uh, it's, it's, it's smaller than white mustard, uh, which is closer to the kind we're familiar with. It was used as a condiment, uh, like, like we use mustard and ketchup, but it was especially used for cooking oil. And here are some pictures of mustard plants. Uh, there's a person in this as well as a mustard plant, but there's a mustard plant that you see really big mustard plant in that case. Well, birds can nest in its branches. Uh, and that suggests that this is a parable 
about the kingdom is if we didn't already know that, if we hadn't already heard Jesus say that, because kingdoms were sometimes compared with trees or large plants, so large the birds could rest in their branches or in the shade of their branches. You have that in Daniel, you have it in Ezekiel, it's used for Babylon, it's used for Egypt, and it's used for God's kingdom, which is what it is here. But you know, different empires could be portrayed that way. And often the, ber the birds and the branches were the different nations that they ruled over. And so the idea that God's kingdom has these birds and the branches reminds us that the kingdom wasn't exclusively for the Jewish people. It is for the Jewish people, but not exclusively for the Jewish people, but God was promising to welcome in the Gentiles, as, as he often said already in, in the Old Testament. Well, after Jesus finishes these parables, and he, and he, he does them just the same way throughout, he, he tells the stories to the people, and they're like scratching their heads over the sermon illustrations, and then explains them privately to his disciples, to the real committed inner core, like you guys. Well, anyway, Jesus says, okay, let's go to the other side. And so they go from Capernaum to Mark says Gerasa, um, Matthew says Gadara. They're, they're both around the same area, so it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. But uh, as they're traveling, they're going to encounter a storm. And we see in this next paragraph, the closing paragraph of Mark chapter four, that even wind and sea obey Jesus. So in Mark 4, 38 to 41, Jesus was in the stern. Normally on, on the ancient ships, the prow, the, the front of the ship, and the stern, the back of the ship, were somewhat elevated. Uh, if I look stern right now, it doesn't have anything to do with ships. But this, you know, ships' uh, sterns were normally elevated. So he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said, said to the sea, peace be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? You still don't have any faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this? But even the wind and the sea obey him. And this is just a, uh, a reconstruction of what the boat looked like. Uh, a boat, a Galilean fishing boat, actually archeologists have found it. Uh, so they reconstructed this based on that. You, you can see you can get a good number of people in there, but you know, limited number. And with the stern, you could be kind of shielded from the, from the storm. So notice also it's, it's a windstorm. <clears throat> Sometimes in the movies, we have it portrayed as like, you know, there's thunder and lightning and, and, and rain coming down. Actually, we don't know there was thunder and lightning at this time. It only mentions the wind and the waves. But the way uh, the mountains around Galilee were shaped, especially when you're in a uh, certain part, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the mountains, wind would be funneled through it. Uh, you know, wind coming from, from both sides of the mountains, it would be forced into a, a narrow chasm between the mountains and it'd be funneled directly under the sea with great force. And so sudden windstorms can arise on the Lake of Galilee. And if you're out in the middle and you're not near shore, you can be in trouble if you're in a small boat. So uh, it was generating huge waves. Medina and I, uh, Medina, you'll, you'll remember uh, the, where, where we like almost were sinking <laughs> in the River Congo with the crocodiles and stuff. Uh, it can be a, a scary feeling. But anyway, water was filling the boat. So they were in danger of sinking because, you know, the wind is lashing the waves over the boat. But it would be less noticeable on the elevated stern than somewhere else. Even, even so, uh, you say, ah, Jesus must have really been tired. Well, he's, he's the one who'd been doing ministry. The others were listening to him. And he's so exhausted, he's sleeping through it. And well, that may be an expression of his faith. Psalm 4, 8, I'll both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. By the way, I'm not saying insomnia is due to lack of faith, as I often have that myself. But anyway, they wake him up, uh, just like in the Psalms. They, they pray to God, God, 
rouse yourself. Why do you sleep, O Lord? Awake. Do not cast us off forever. Defend us. Vindicate your name. That's a, that's a familiar prayer. Well, here they're praying it to Jesus. But we also have a, a, a case, probably even an allusion to this in the Old Testament. I mean, remember Jonah, he's, uh, he's heading from, from uh, Joppa. He's planning to go to Tarshish to get as far away as possible from Nineveh. Well, this big storm comes up on the sea and he's asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what are you doing? Sound asleep, get up, call on your God. Perhaps that God will spare a thought so that we don't perish. And he said, oh, it's, it's actually this storm is caused by my God. He, he wants to drown me. Uh, so, hey, and they're like, wait, wait a minute. Uh, you didn't tell us that when we took you on board. And finally, he insists, look, if you want the storm to stop, then you're going to have to throw me overboard. He really doesn't want to go to Nineveh. So they cried out to the Lord, Lord, please, we pray, don't let us perish in account of this man's life. So they threw Jonah into the midst of the sea, and the sea ceased its raging. And then, of course, he gets swallowed by a big uh, fish or something like that and is carried, carried off to, to Nineveh. Now, big difference, though, between the Jonah story and this story. In Jonah, he's asleep, but he's running from God's purpose. Here we have a different prophet who is the very expression and embodiment of God's purpose. And they wake him up and he doesn't, he doesn't have to be thrown into the sea to make it stop. You know, he can, he can speak to the sea himself and he commands and the wind and the sea are calm. Now notice what he says. Don't, don't you have any faith yet? Where, where, where's your faith? Why are you still afraid? Now, he's not dealing with people with like an anxiety disorder or something. You know, you say that to them, to me, it'll just make us more anxious. Well, actually it did make them more anxious, but uh, this wasn't because of an anxiety disorder. They should know who he is by now. They've seen so many things already. They're going to see a lot more things and they'll figure out who he is, but they don't know who he is yet. So even if he's asleep and not still in the storm, they, they, they should know, okay, even if he's not awake to still the storm, God the Father is awake and God's not gonna let the boat go down with, with Jesus in it. Obviously his mission isn't done yet. So he's like, you still don't recognize my identity? And when he says that, he says, why are you scared? They're scared all the more um, because they don't, they, don't, they don't get it yet. They don't understand. They've heard the interpretations of the parables. They still don't understand. Um, that should make us happy because, well, not happy that they didn't understand, but happy that even though they had just partial understanding and partial faith, um, they, they were still welcome to grow in more. They weren't perfect yet. They were like us, right? There was still more, more for them to do, but, but we should be encouraged. We don't need to be afraid because as Pastor Jason pointed out, God has the end already sorted out. We already know what's going to happen at the end. Um, this, this theme is going to come up again in the next chapter, where Jesus says to the leader of the synagogue, don't fear, only believe. Now, uh, this is just a list. I'm not going to go through all these, obviously. This is just a list of, um, of examples of, of where you have fear in the Gospel of Mark. And sometimes it's honorable fear, sometimes um, like with the disciples at least. And then sometimes it's dishonorable fear like the authorities being afraid of the people and so on. But um, here's where we have the theme of faith in Mark's gospel. So, so this passage, like, well, each passage normally reflects themes that run through the whole work. That's important to note whenever we look at a passage in a work to see how it reflects the themes that run through Mark's well through through that whole work, and in the case of Mark's gospel, uh, faith is something that can counter fear. In that we don't need to be afraid, because we know the one that we trust. Um, that doesn't mean we're never afraid. Again, we're like the disciples, but we're growing. And the the whole issue of this paragraph and the whole issue of the first half of Mark's gospel 
is Jesus' secret identity. The first half of Mark's gospel, you've got people saying, who is this guy? Uh, a number of times, you know, in, in Mark chapter 1, what kind of guy is this that even the demons obey him? Uh, Mark chapter 6, what's this wisdom that, that this guy has? And uh, here, who, who is this that the winds and the, and the sea obey him? Well, the middle of the gospel, Simon Peter's going to get it. Oh, you're the Messiah. But he's still only got half the secret identity, which doesn't help him understand why it's a secret. It's actually the other half of the gospel where he's on the road to the cross. After the cross and the resurrection, that's when they'll get, ah, he's this kind of Messiah. A, a Messiah who conquers not through force and enacting violence, but who conquers through absolute trust in his father and willingness to endure sacrifice. Uh, well, in terms of who is this at the wind and the sea obey him? You look in Exodus, you look in Psalms, you look in Jonah. The one, who's the one who commands the wind and the sea and they obey? God, Yahweh. So who is this at the wind and the sea obey? Jesus is Yahweh. And, you know, between this and the transfiguration and, and so on, they're eventually going to get more of the idea. Now, can storms actually be stilled? I mean, Jesus is Yahweh. But does he ever allow storms to be stilled when we pray to him today? Uh, Kevin Burr was, was one of my PhD students until he graduated. Uh, and he reports an incident where he and, and four other believers were, were coming back from a conference when they were caught in a serious hailstorm. And the uh, description that he gives of the hailstorm and also what I found out by checking the weather reports for that date was that there were F4 tornadoes in that area. So the, 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 the hail was coming down like golf balls uh, and eventually like softballs and base, baseballs. And it even shattered a truck window. Uh, they pulled under, under a, uh, an overhang and then they, they got out and they prayed together. He prayed at the top of his lungs. The storm stopped immediately. And uh, one of them even, uh, snapped a picture of some of the uh, hailstones still on the ground. Immediately, uh, a, uh, a rainbow came out. Now, this is one I witnessed. Yes, that is a picture of me. There was a time in my life when I had hair. But in any case, um, this was when I was ministering at a, an HBCU, um, a, an African-American college in North Carolina. I was actually teaching at the seminary, working with the campus ministry at the adjoining uh, uh, college. And we were planning to have an outreach one day and students from another college came to join us to help us with the outreach. And rain was just pouring down that day. Um, obviously we hadn't known that when we scheduled the outreach. And it was, it was you know, the weather forecast, it was supposed to be like all day long, almost 100% supposed to rain all day long. And one of the sophomores, a biology major from one of the other, uh, from the other college said, well, let's pray, see what God will do. She led us in a prayer and the rain stopped right away. And this is not just a, a distant recollection of mine, exaggerated my memory. I mean, I have it recorded in my journal for that very day, um, you know, what, what happened. The rain stopped, the sun came out, the sun was out the rest of the day, and we got to do outreach. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of Watchman Nee. Uh, now, uh, Watchman Nee was honorable in many ways. There are some things he taught that I don't agree with, but this is just telling a story about when he was doing evangelism with some colleagues in his younger days. He, uh, he and his friends were out evangelizing a village and people said, why should we believe in your God? Look, our God here is so powerful that for 286 years, I think it was 286 years, it's never rained on the day that the festival of our God is scheduled. Whenever the priests schedule the festival, it doesn't rain on that day. And so one of Watchman's colleagues said, well, this year it is going to rain on that day. And they mocked him. Well, he went back to 
his fellow Christians and they said, you shouldn't have promised that because if it doesn't rain, nobody's gonna listen to us. But eh, nobody was listening to them anyway, right? So they began to pray that God would, would help them. And on the day that the priests had scheduled for the festival, they had the biggest rainstorm that they'd had in years. So much so that the priests in their festal procession were swept off their feet. The statue of their God fell to the ground and broke. They said, well, we, 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 uh, we miscalculated. Let's reschedule the festival. Well, on that day, it rained also. And so a lot of people came to Christ in that, in that village. Um, another example is from Dr. Emmanuel Thompson. He, uh, uh, he got his, his PhD at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, but he uh, was my, my colleague where I taught before. He grew up in Nigeria. His father was a Nigerian church planter there. And when he was planting a church in a previously unevangelized community, rainy season was about to start. And local people were making fun of him saying, look, you, 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 you said God told you to move here. Well, look what God is gonna do because it's rainy season and the rain is about to pour down. Everything you have is gonna be ruined because he didn't have a roof on his, on his home yet. He said, well, it was gonna take four more days to get a roof on his home. He said, well, God is, is gonna not let it rain. One drop of rain in this village until I have a roof on my house. Uh, in, Emmanuel, of course, was part of the family. He was young then, but he was part of the family. And I think he was maybe 12 years old. And his father fell on his face before God and said, oh God, what have I just done? But for the next four days, water fell all around the village and not a single drop of rain fell in the village. And after four days, only one person in that village had not become a Christian. And in that village, they still speak of this as the precipitating event that brought about their conversion. Uh, pardon the, the pun, it actually doesn't work in their language how so, but anyway. <clears throat> so now coming to Mark chapter five, Jesus overthrows one of Satan's armies. The legion, it wasn't just one demon. This is a whole legion of demons. This is a lot of demons. So we talked earlier about demons but that was just maybe one or a few, but this is a bunch of them. Jesus uh, and his disciples, the boat finally lands and they're in the territory of the Gerasenes, which is also basically the territory of the Gadarenes, like, like Matthew says, because it's, you know, they're all, they're all part of the Decapolis. Um, Gadara was closer, but Gerasa was more well-known. So Mark uses the more well-known title Matthew uses the somewhat closer title. But anyway, the, the theological point of it is that Jesus' authority knows no boundaries. He's been doing this stuff in Galilee and Judea, but he's not just the Lord of Galileans and Judeans. He's the Lord of all the earth. And he can confront a whole army of demons. Well, this, this guy, he's living among the tombs and, it, and Mark says that nobody could bind him anymore even with a chain. Often he'd been restrained with shackles and chains, but he'd wrench them apart and no one had the strength to subdue him. But remember what Mark already says about, about Jesus, what, what Jesus says in Mark in, in 327, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first binding the strong man. Then he can plunder his property. And Jesus casting out demons He's saying he's bound Satan and therefore is able to cast out these, these demons. Well, we're going to get a good example of this. Satan can't stand before Jesus. Now, the man was cutting himself with stones. This picture is not a picture of that, that guy, but it's a picture uh, from the internet of um, a, a case of possession trance where people become like immune to pain uh, but they, they do things that, that are harmful to their bodies. So sometimes in cases of possession trance, uh, people do self-harm 
or become risks to others. It's not all the time, but sometimes they do, uh, walking on hot coals or, or things like that. Now, I don't think this is a deliberate allusion to the passage in 1 Kings, but remember the uh, pr priests and prophets of all are cutting themselves with swords and lances, drawing out blood. Um, I'm glad that, that um, the kind of miracles that God likes to do are more edifying, like healing people, rather than having them say, okay, you can cut yourselves and not feel it too much right now. Uh, but he was cutting himself with stones. So these demons are not in his best, center, his best interest. I mean, they're not there to make him uh, healthy. And when you see what happens to the pigs, you realize, ooh, these are really not healthy demons. I mean, they, they hurt people uh, as demons normally do. Well, notice what the, the, the uh, demon speaking through this man says to Jesus. I, I adjure you by God. Adjuring is a way of you know, putting somebody under oath, making them swear something. Sometimes it's used in magical texts you know, to try to uh, force compliance, force demons compliance. Well, this demon is, is like trying to use magic maybe on, on Jesus. I adjure you by God. Now think of the nerve of this. He's, he's adjuring Jesus by his own father, you know, <laughs> as if Jesus has to, you know, Jesus is the one representing the father's will. And also the demon at the same time, he says, I adjure you by God, don't torment me. Again, he's got a lot of nerve. I mean, what's he been doing to this poor guy he's been possessing all this time? but tormenting him. Demons don't observe Geneva Conventions. Well, Legion, uh, Jesus says, what's your name? And he doesn't do this normally with demons, but uh, in magical texts, if, if uh, getting the name of a, of a spirit would give you control over it, the demons tried to do that with Jesus. Oh, I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth, but of course it didn't work. You can't use magic on Jesus. But Jesus asked the, the, the uh, demon his name, and it turns out it's not just one demon, uh, there's a lot of them. And so, uh, you know, but, but you could say a lot of them without saying legion. It's probably military language. There was an understanding, you've already got it in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 10, there was an understanding that angels, uh, you had angelic armies. Uh, like the, the Lord of hosts, remember, that's the Lord of, of armies and uh, speaks of his heavenly hosts and, and so on. Well, it's, it's military language. Angels were understood to be arranged in ranks. That was also in Jewish tradition. And uh, Jesus also spoke in chapter three of Satan having a kingdom, like a counter kingdom against God's kingdom. And it has some organization to it. So, yeah, this is a, this is an, a demonic army. And that has implication for human armies, I mean, like for human legions. But the focus here is more on uh, the spiritual issue. Um, and actually, maybe let me say something about, actually, I think, I thought I had a picture of this, but maybe not. Anyway, let me just say something about um, spiritual warfare in terms of, of spiritual armies. You've already got this in the Old Testament. Before Jacob faces Esau in Genesis 33, in Genesis 32, he wrestles with an angel all night long to get ready for it. The spiritual battle prepared him for what was to come. Um, you have the cases in 2 Samuel and in Chronicles where God says to David, don't move on the Philistines until you hear this rustling in the treetops that sounds like an army marching, the armies of heaven. Or like when uh, Elisha, you know, his servant says to him, what are we going to do? This army is surrounding us. And Elisha says, God, open his eyes. And then he sees the mountains full of the armies of the Lord, um, chariots of fire. It wasn't just one chariot of fire, you know, that took up Elijah. The, full of chariots of fire. We don't have to worry. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them, for sure. And greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. So, <clears throat> Uh, spiritual army, and and they they're reduced to pleading with him, to they're they're just desperate. They say don't don't make us leave the country. Well, 
they may have really been comfortable there because um, you know this was in the tombs, and what um, Gentiles often did was they would often bring sacrifices and offerings. Uh, like some of the pigs they're feeding on the hillside, some of those would be used for sacrifices to the dead, uh, which the Old Testament warns against. So, you know, the, the spirits may like it there for that reason. And anthropologists, when they talk about spirit possession, they also note that spirits often are associated with particular areas. And even with human armies, usually soldiers became attached to, to particular locales. They were often in this period recruited locally. Many took concubines and had kids locally. They weren't allowed to marry for their 20 year, during their 20 years of service in the military, uh, Roman military, but they, they could take concubines on the side and have kids. So they're attached to the local area and it looks like uh, the local area is also attached to them. The demons don't wanna leave the area. And when Jesus does cast out the demons, the people want Jesus to leave the area uh, as if he's the problem <laughs> rather than the demons. So they, they, they ask, please let us enter the pigs. Don't send us away. Let us enter those pigs over there. Now that's a step down. They're making a concession. They'd rather be in one human being than in 2000 pigs because human being is, is higher up. I mean, they, they'd much rather have a a more prestigious habitat. But pigs are already unclean according to the Levitical law. So it's the unclean spirits going into unclean pigs, you know, it seems suitable. But remember, they're reduced to wanting to enter pigs. Um, it's, it's a big step down. 2,000 pigs was a huge herd. It may have belonged to the entire community. Uh, Usually they didn't have that many pigs in a, in a particular area. Now, a literal legion of Roman soldiers would be like five or 6,000 soldiers. It was a lot of, a lot of people. Um, we don't know that this was literal, but you know, that literally this has, you know, to have the name legion, it has to be five or 6,000, but it's a lot, a lot of demons. And actually they may outnumber the pigs, but all these demons have been tormenting this one man with self-destructive impulses hadn't finished him off, uh, but all these self-destructive impulses are about to go into the pigs. We're gonna see what's gonna happen there. Uh, yes, and you think I'm boring. Uh, here's a picture of an ancient boar. So Jesus gave them permission. Now, not every granted request is good for the requester, uh, and not every refused request is bad for the requester. I mean, later on, James and John, let us have seats at your right hand and your left. And in the context of the rest of Mark's gospel, uh, they don't understand what they're asking for as Jesus explains to them. Those seats are reserved for the robbers crucified on Jesus' right and his left. So sometimes Jesus says no, and it's really for our good. Uh, this time he says yes, and it's really for the demons bad. So the pigs run into the sea. Now, this is also unusual. Pigs lack a herd instinct. Uh, so it's not just like, you know, one pig goes and the others follow. But the demons have been cooped up inside this guy. They may be used to acting in concert. And something else strange in this, in this narrative is pigs actually, you know, maybe one of you is a pig farmer and you can correct me, but from what I understand, pigs are able to swim. But it's one thing to be able to swim a little bit. It's another thing if you're trying to swim after rushing off a cliff and you've got hundreds of pigs coming down on top of you afterwards, you know, the, probably the impact is gonna, anyway, uh, they didn't do too well. So why are the pigs destroyed? Well, here are following options. You may have thought of these options yourself because the narrative doesn't actually explain it exactly, but. Maybe it's the destructive impulses of the demons. They wanted to harm their hosts and these demons are so stupid, they kill off their hosts and end up being, being bound in the, in the lake. Um, or maybe the demons wanna make Jesus look bad so the people will drive him away. But again, that doesn't fit because they're gonna be stuck in the lake. 
maybe the pigs were so tormented that they all committed suicide. Maybe. Um, maybe Jesus wanted the demons destroyed and bound, and this was his plan to do it. And for him, the freedom of one human being was worth more than 2,000 pigs. And that wasn't just because pigs aren't kosher. Are the demons destroyed? In some later rabbinic stories, they do talk about demons being destroyed. Uh, that's not Bible, that's you know, some Jewish traditions. But more commonly in earlier Jewish sources, demons are bound. So like in First Enoch, which was not, by the way, written by Enoch, it's from the second century BC. So it's like uh, after the finishing of the Old Testament, before the writing of the New Testament. But um, First Enoch is kind of a novel, but uh, there we have demons being bound. Sometimes they're bound in pits. Sometimes they're bound beneath bodies of water in different Jewish documents. Well, what, what that means is they may not be destroyed. You know, the pigs were, the, whether the demons were or not, the demons are rendered inoperative. They're bound. And that means that Jesus has delivered the entire region from a demonic stronghold. If you've heard of Johann Christoph Blumhardt, he was a he was a German Lutheran pastor in the Black Forest region of Germany in the 1800s, who had a ministry of healing and exorcism. And it began with this one really difficult case of a woman in this congregation who was thoroughly demonized. And just, she'd have these seizures, she'd have no control, demons would speak through her. Uh, and, you know, he'd be trying to cast out demons and eggshells and stuff would come out. So finally, he, uh, finally, though, he's invoking Jesus. You know, he's been doing this for a while. Finally, he succeeds. And, and the, the demons cry out, Jesus is victor. The demons come out. But it wasn't just, they weren't just affecting this woman. It broke a spiritual stronghold in the entire region. And healings began happening and other exorcisms began happening. Well, the herders fled and announced this. Now the word for announced is used also in this narrative, one of the only other two times it's used in Mark's gospel, where Jesus says to the man who's been delivered, go home and announce, tell everybody what the Lord has done for you. So the herders go back with a negative report, the delivered man goes back with a positive report. They find this man clothed and sane. Well, apparently he was naked before, you know, if he's ripping his chains, the clothes probably aren't in good condition. So um, Jesus is going to tell his disciples, don't take an extra cloak. But that's in chapter six. He hasn't done it yet. So somebody probably has an extra cloak, clothes him. Nakedness was a matter of shame in that culture. But they find this man clothed and sane, no longer acting insane. Well, we've got different responses to Jesus in this narrative. Notice the demons beg to stay. The community begs Jesus to leave. And the delivered man begs Jesus to let him come with him uh, because they have different recognitions. The demons realize, uh oh, we have to submit to this man. The community is like, this guy's scary. Look what he did to our, our pigs. And the delivered man is like, I want to be with you. I want to follow you. Jesus, you, you can imagine it wouldn't go over too well. I mean, it's, it's bad enough. Jesus has a tax collector among his followers. He's got a Gentile among his followers. That's going to be a problem. But anyway, uh, Jesus commissions the man instead to go back. They want Jesus to leave. Uh, the demons don't want to leave, but the community wants Jesus to leave um, because they valued the pork more than they valued the one delivered man. But elsewhere in Mark's gospel, we see that one human life, one, one soul is worth more than all the world apart from the human life there. Um, and and so we see the contrast between human values and God's value. Well, uh, God's values. The man does more than demand it. Jesus tells him to tell his family. The man tells the whole Decapolis. That this is the east, uh, much of it is on the east of the Lake of Galilee, which uh, included some Jewish people, but it was especially Gentile territory. Jesus comes back to this Gentile territory in chapter seven, and people are open to him because this man's healing had paved the way. So it looks bad for now. Oh, look, what kind of witness is this? He's got everybody turned against him. But don't look at how things are in the short run. Remember that God has everything under control in the long run. 
and then they're gonna head back to Capernaum. So we get to actually leave off at a real leaving off point this week. And uh, I'm coming back to uh, ending my, my screen share, if I can find, uh, there we go. And Ranjo, over to you. Wow, that was, uh, that was fantastic. Um, I have a couple of questions here. I want to remind you all, if um, you have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or follow ups to something that Craig talks about. Um, I want to stick with, maybe work our way backwards a little bit because um, this topic was, was really good. And um, something I was wondering is you, you started by talking about some of these miraculous claims that people have made. And I just wonder, when is it appropriate to do something like that, I mean, should because you know the Bible always says don't don't test God. So when is it appropriate? I mean, is it something where? Well, actually, just go ahead and answer it. I'll qualify it. Are, are you talking about like um, going out in the midst of a storm? Mm -hmm. And or or like you said, uh, the example of your friend who just said it's not going to rain for four days till my house has got a roof. You know. Now he regretted saying that afterwards, but God honored it. It was for the sake of the gospel. But yeah, normally you don't wanna, yeah, he was actually speaking out of anger too. So he, he really didn't expect God to honor it. But again, it was for the sake of the gospel and God God honored it for his, his namesake. Um, normally you don't wanna promise that God is gonna do something unless you've really heard from God because it brings reproach in the gospel if, something doesn't happen but there are other th and, and, and the, the guy um the guy in china i think he really felt this was from the lord that the lord was saying this so it matters the context it also matters because a lot of the stories i have of stilled storms are stories from evangelism contexts of reaching unreached people so our expectations should be higher when we are sharing Christ with people who haven't really had a good exposure to the gospel before. But yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to put God's name on the line without having considerable confidence. Um, if that, that, um, you know, John Wimber talks about risk. And that's true. I'm kind of risk averse. I tend to err on the other side. So I don't want to prophesy unless I'm sure. You can you can err too much on either side. And I probably err too much on the one, but. So Phil, help me out with this question here. There's Phil Estes. He said, does this coincide with binding and loosing an analogy about uh, taking authority? Curious about the effect of the man kneeling before Jesus. Oh, those are two questions. Okay. The, the, uh, the binding and loosing and also the man kneeling before Jesus. Let me deal with the second one first. The, the guy kneels before him. Uh, either it's the man himself who's trying to seek freedom, but since the demons are speaking through him, I think that's probably less likely. Or it's the, the demons recognizing who their Lord is, and it's a preemptive attempt to uh, keep from getting in worse trouble by, <laughs> by trying to flee. Um, but in the, because uh, when you fall before somebody, that was a posture of submission and sometimes even a worship. But in the case, or a petition, uh, in the case though of binding and loosing, uh, where we have those terms together, we often think of it in terms of, of Matthew 16, 18, or 19, and uh, Matthew 18, 18. Mm -hmm. And those contexts are not referring to, to demons. I mean, in Matthew 18, 18, if, you're, if it's a demon, you're, if it's a devil you're trying to cast out, it's not a literal devil, it's a human devil, because uh, that's a context more of excommunication. Um, and uh, you do have the binding of Satan in Revelation 20, um, which is, well, without getting into controversy, let me just say, maybe someday we'll do a Bible study in Revelation. Um, but in this case, uh, Jesus has already bound, well, 
there's two interpretations. Either Jesus, every time he casts out a demon, his act of casting out the demons is binding them, or he's already actually bound them by, by defeating Satan at the temptation. Now, whichever of those views is true, it doesn't entail us having to say, I bind you before casting out a demon. Um, and I don't know we have any- Yeah, that's a good point. Thing for loosing them. Actually, where you have the, the language of binding and loosing demons most often in antiquity, uh, as opposed to just like binding, binding demons in, in pits and things like that, God doing that, was um, in ancient magical texts where they would try to get, get spirits to do their, magicians would try to get them to do their bidding. Uh, and that's not a good example. So that's not to say God won't, you know, God doesn't wait till we have our formulas right. If we have faith, God can, God can answer it, whether, you know, we say I bind you or, or not. Um, the real issue is that we trust in the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ in his name. When we invoke his presence, mm -hmm. it's going to make the demons uncomfortable. They, they don't belong in his presence. Can't stand his presence. Can I uh, ask a follow-up to that? You had talked a little bit about naming and how that was kind of a, a magic that people used. I've heard in different contexts, people have said that, you know, when you're trying to cast out a devil, cast out a demon, it's helpful to know its name. Um, you know what it is to cast it out. And there's some sort of authority that comes with knowing someone's name, which was, I think, a principle in the Old Testament, uh, New Testament, or early church, Greco-Roman period. Um, but also, and this may be very way off, but I'm just, uh, in Revelation, come back to Revelation, you know, the, the imagery of Jesus um, returning, riding on a horse, you know, and, you know, he's got all these names, and then it says he's got one name that nobody knows. And I'd interpret it as that means that no one has authority over him in any way. It, could you speak into that? Is that just uh, not biblically um, you're, based? You're right, you're right about the principle of authority, but in the, the examples we see in the, in the Gospels and Acts don't suggest that we actually need to know the demons' names to cast them out. The one name we need to know to cast out demons is the name of Jesus. So. Jesus asked the demon's name in this case, probably because, you know, it's not acting like a single demon. And, and so, you know, he has, he's identifying a plurality of demons there. But, uh, and there's one other time when he addresses a demon by a, a title, and that's in Mark chapter nine, you, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you to come out of him. But uh, there's nothing that says we have to know their names. Now, of course, sometimes people use Mark 5 as an example because, you know, sometimes you're having trouble casting it out, so you look to the next, the next step. But um, in, in Acts, when Paul commands the, the Spirit to come out, he just says, in the name of Jesus Christ, you know, come out. So, uh, yeah, just we need to know Jesus' name. There was a book, I think, Pigs in the Parlor, that circulated a few decades ago. I think it sold more than a million copies. And some of it was actually all this information about demons based on interviews they made with demons before they cast them out. Now, if you can expect that demons are gonna tell you the truth, that might be a good book. But given the fact that demons are deceitful, I really think probably that's not a good, <laughs> a good, uh, place to learn your demonology. And unfortunately, it's had influence in some other, some other traditions. Thanks, Craig. Hey, I'm, we're going to let you guys get into your groups. Craig, why don't you close us in prayer? Yeah. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you that we have the Gospels. We have these, you know, we don't live in the first century, but we still have the reports from the first century about, about your son, Jesus. And so, God, we pray that you'll teach us to be more like Jesus. We pray that you'll teach us to trust Jesus, to, to recognize he's Lord of the wind and the waves. He's Lord over all the demonic armies he can command. 
and they have no power. So, Father, we pray that you will help us to exalt the name of Jesus and be agents of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Please make us one, one body, and as the body of Christ, help us to exhibit the character of Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, the functioning together as different gifts of the Spirit, so when people see your church, they can see the love of Christ. They can see and hear Christ still speaking through us to them. Thank you, God, for your precious Holy Spirit who empowers us. We offer praise to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior. Amen.